Okay, next slide. So a couple of quick guidelines for the discussion. This was my starting point, so certainly feel free to add or ask questions. Um, so the city must follow the procurement process required by law for each of our procurements. So there are there's a legal framework here that we have to stay within. Um, we're striving for an equitable, competitive, and transparent process. Um, we want everyone to feel like they have a fair chance to be involved. We're looking to make innovation more accessible for the city. I mean, you guys, let's say you guys have met the mayor, some of you probably have, but I think we all feel like we know him. He wants Chicago to be the most innovative, technologically savvy city on the planet. I'm lucky he limits it to the planet these days. Um, and so any good idea that you guys have, we are going to try and figure out. Um, that's what he wants me to strive for. We're looking to make it easier for all technology companies to do business with the city. So that's you know, what we're here to work on. Um, and trying to identify challenges that are posing a barrier to you to doing business with me and defining potential solutions to those challenges. So that's what I'm trying to do. Are there other things that you're hoping to get out of tonight? Somebody's going to say something eventually. OK, so I took a stab at a starting point. <laughs> um, so, and I divided up the challenges that, that I think you might be having, um, and it's always dangerous to put yourself in someone else's shoes, but I figured we had to start somewhere, especially since you guys don't talk, um, to, in terms of how to make the IT procurement process better, I divided it into process challenges and requirement challenges, because there's a boatload of requirements that you have to sort of respond to or provide for. Um, when the city is going through a procurement process. So the process challenges, so some of them, so sometimes it can be access to, to leadership in the department, whether that's me or um, the person who leads application development for me. There are certainly times in the procurement process where we are meant to be at arm's length to keep things fair for everybody, but there's other times where you're absolutely supposed to be able to come and talk to me and tell me what you or your company does or learn from me what my priorities are. Um, so, and I know some people can feel like there isn't that accessibility, so I don't know if any of you have felt that way. The number of steps in the procurement process can feel um, numerous and voluminous. I know I feel that way. Um, total processing time from when the city may start a procurement to when you find out if you, one, can start contracting or when the contract is even awarded. Um, unclear hurdles. Do you even know what the procurement process is? Um, others. like. What do you guys feel like the challenges are? And then requirements challenges, right? I don't know if you guys have ever seen a functional specification from us. I've heard both sides of this. Some people have told me your functional specifications are fantastic. I know exactly what you want because there's 400 functional specs to go from one web page. Um, and then I've heard the other side of that, which is sometimes, I won't tell you where I fall on this. I've heard the other side of that, which is 400 functional specifications to build one website. Like, can you tell me what you're trying to achieve from a business perspective and let me tell you the best way to do it? Um, so there's there's two sides to that. Um, we have insurance requirements. We require usually three to four references depending on what we're contracting for. We require audited financial statement. Um, you're lucky we don't ask for your firstborn. Uh, you can have mine. Um, so I don't know how you feel about all of those hurdles in terms of what is required to actually sign a contract with us. There's a lot there. Um, so this is the list I came up with in terms of how to start. Um, so this is the starting point I had. So so how many people here, since none of you have said anything yet, um, have actually tried to bid on a piece of city work? Anybody? Got one, two. How'd it go? Awesome. You'll do it again. It was easy. You're growing your business. <laughs> it was really confusing. Okay. It was really confusing. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I have an email from the consumer process right now, and I don't actually understand what they're asking me for. Okay. Um, and I also found that I didn't fit with any of the predefined boxes that that was set forth in the procurement list. You know, like you have steel suppliers, and you have people that supply you with pens, but yep. you don't necessarily have people that provide you with technology or software that helps your technology operate better. Okay. I, well, or applying. I don't know. I just didn't fit within what I saw. Okay. You guys limited me to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good point. So there's definitely some education that can be done to help figure out where people fit. Because I know there's 
there's sort of two approaches. Sometimes we're going to market for, and we've had, you're not the only one who's asked that question or had that challenge, because sometimes we're going to market for a specific thing like, you know, a new 311 system, which is a huge procurement for a giant system. Other times we are creating new pools where we're looking for people that have web developer skills or we're looking for people with business intelligence skills. Um, and had we been going through that process, you probably would have found an easier home for what you or your company does. Um, and I think the, the flip side, though, too, is we sometimes don't know what the best answer is to the business problem we have. And that's a tougher challenge where we probably need, and, and this came up in the session I think we had on Friday, um, where we need to come up with a better way to engage between my department and, let's just call it the startup community for lack of a better word, or the technical community in Chicago, because you guys are developing, whether it's services or products, um, or a, however you want to word it, that probably are answers to business problems we know we have, but I'm never going to write an RFP for that because I don't know what to ask for, which is a different problem for us to figure out. Um, and, and making the procurement process better is never going to fix that one because that's a knowledge transfer issue where I need to know what you're developing first and, and help create a fit between you and the department with the business challenge that that addresses. And, and that comes before we ever get to a procurement issue. And there might be a pilot. There, who knows? Um, but that's a knowledge transfer issue that we need to figure out. And I think a couple of points. So if you've gotten an email from procurement people that you don't understand, yeah. certainly feel free to email back and say, I don't, I, I don't get this. Okay. There's one caveat. So. We, we get a lot of questions, say it's an active procurement, proposals aren't due yet. Um, we try to limit our communication to the entire pool. So if people have questions, um, sometimes, uh, you know, companies will get kind of frustrated. Hey, I asked a question a week ago, I didn't get a response. Typically what we do is we put the response together in, in an addendum or a clarification and we give it to everybody that's, that's on the takeout list. Um, but I'm happy to, if you yeah. want to see me at the end of this meeting. I will do that. We, we had two experiences. One was uh, we knew socially some people who were in the IT department of the city, and they were, <coughs> this is about 2000 or late 90s, they weren't happy with the first city's first website, so they asked us to get on the second website. Yeah. And I, they sent me all the forms, and I spent a week filling up. It was actually based on forms that are used to build bridges, so they asked about tons of concrete and steel. Okay. Required <laughs> X number of millions of dollars in bonds and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I waited through it. I spent a whole week, and then the guy called me and said, it's going to one of Daily's friends in Florida. He might as well stop. Uh, uh, okay. Which we did. And then we did. We did I put together a team that did Chicago lobbyists about the same time the city council passed an ordinance requiring a site like Chicago lobbyists. Right. And then we get the, you can read the whole story on our blog, yep. I'm sure you have. Yep. And uh, I went to an accounting firm that jabbed it out to a couple of guys in Cleveland and didn't get anything at all like, you know, totally unusable thing. Mm -hmm. Paid $273,000 and I went through our web and text timesheets, and I talked to the other guys who worked on the project. We had a total of about fifty thousand dollars worth of labor on that project. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what spurred our initial. Yeah. And then John Tolvin and Brett Goldstein got us in a meeting with the procurement people, and the procurement people just wanted to show us how to fill out the forms better. Mm -hmm. And we kept we kept raising the issue. Of, well, if you if you bought a bridge and the first car that went over it collapsed, is that a problem? Mm -hmm. Well, as long as it goes through the process, it's not a problem. Right. But somehow, web procurement is different. You can build a website that's totally un unfunctional. So we started questioning, is it in the process? Or is it the, you know, what's the, so that's what we're hoping you, right. you do something about it. Yeah, so I'm not going to comment on the first one. No, I know you can't. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, 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 yeah. Well, and everyone's, cha everyone's changed since then, so, so 
<laughs> yeah. So, um, and on the second one, I think so, and that is what we're trying to change, right? On the second one is, and 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 Jamie, and that's why James is here, and, and Jamie Reed, who's the CPO, is fully on board with this initiative. Is how do we change the process so that we can we can access people who have this the skills like you who built Chicago lobbyists so that um, particularly around the web, right? Nobody loves the website. Um, we know that there's room for improvement there. So how do we access the right people who can make improvements on that? Um, and and frankly, so and it's no secret. And you know, Juan did a good job of, of reminding everyone, including me, that we don't we don't have a lot of money to do anything. So given that we're we're going to be spending limited dollars, how do we get the best work for every limited dollar that we get to spend? You can spend less money and get better work. That's right. Problem. No, exactly. <laughs> Right. No, I, I agree with you. So, and I think we can get that out of this process, um, and and even even the problems that we can't fix with this process, I think we can surface. Which is the problem, the other problem you brought up, which is is the the technologies that are being developed that we don't even know how to ask for. Which that doesn't get fixed by fixing the procurement process, but at least we've surfaced that problem, and we'll work on figuring out how to address that too. Um, so I, I don't have the answer just yet. Um, but at least now I have the problem, and I think we will figure it out. I think we will figure it out. And we have some suggestions. Okay. It seems to me <clears throat> there's at least one one question that I have that's um, around sort of open source innovation. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned this group buying mentality of <clears throat> taking different departments and let's throw in our lot together with Park District and others mm -hmm. and buy this sort of volume license, right? It makes perfect sense for the old software, the way I call enterprise software, the stuff that's yeah. outdated by the time it lands on your desk. It does sometimes. But yeah. it doesn't really make sense for open source. Mm -hmm. right. And what's your take on that? And also, I hear a lot from the city that well, we don't have any money, but you guys are really happy to write checks to Oracle every year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I'll <coughs> in the millions. I'm happy to take that one on directly. We, at this point, we are not going to build an open source ERP system. Right? I, unless someone can bring me a value proposition of how I'm going to support that and be able to hire the resources to support that day in and day out, I, I can't see the value proposition from a total cost of ownership or how the city is going to take that on with the ability that I have to hire skilled resources to support that. I am a strong supporter of open source, and we use it extensively in software development and advanced analytics. Right, and Tom can talk to you till he's blue in the face about about what we do around open source there. And and I'll go back to what I meant by volume buying and the areas where we use that because it's and it's because it's it's actually more around services than it is around software actually. Um, but. And, and where we invest in Oracle is actually primarily in, is actually only I think in our ERP system and a couple of core spots of middleware where we're actually out of it. But um, with with open source, right, there is a trade off, and it's not a dollar for dollar, but there is a trade off around support resources, right? Right. <laughs> right. Depends on the open source. Yeah. It does, yeah. but you do have to support it. You have to have someone that can implement it. You have to have someone that can support it. It doesn't sit there and run by itself, right? Neither does package software, right. but it doesn't yeah. sit there and run by itself. So can and we assume that, that uh, the ERP software actually depends on Oracle? It requires Oracle, and if you break that, that you break it, right? Is that the idea? Like the ERP software will not be supported by the ERP vendor if it's no longer pointing at Oracle. Basically, I'm saying it's a dependency. It's yeah. a dependency that can't go away. Is yeah. What I'm saying. But that that's a sticky point, right? Like if you can't replace the database that's underlying because of the licensing agreement that you have for the support of the ERP system, then you can't get rid of the Oracle, right? The application layer is is Oracle. The application layer. So that's what I'm talking about. So it's, it's their ebus oh. suite. Oh. Application. Okay. And so yeah, that's right. not really Oracle anymore. That's wacky app engine. Yeah, and so then the underlying database, of course, gets right. tied to that as well right. it's uh, because it's a very, pretty complicated scheme over a right. pretty complicated scheme. Right. Uh, it's and just so, yeah. something that I'm worried about. But that's why you got silence after you said, we can't get rid of Oracle, right? Is because you know there's engineers in the room going, whoa, whoa. Oh, wait, no, that's, so that, <laughs> no, that's my point. There's engineers in the room, right? So when you engineers 
want to come work for the city for $65,000 a year. Hey, it's not that bad. <laughs> for the number of you that I will you will, that I will need to come and replace that, come on, and we will figure it out. I, I, I don't think we can. I don't no, think, I'm serious. Yeah, this, this is this discussion. I, I think we're just talking about first of all getting good design, which can sit on any kind of any back end system. Agreed. Yeah. And in the UK, they haven't replaced all the Oracle systems no. and their IBM systems. They're just making Absolutely. progress in. They're yes. doing some open source stuff. When as are sense, as are we, and they're not when it doesn't make sense because they have their tied to legacy systems. And that's exactly, and that's exactly where, and that's exactly what we're doing. And our legacy systems are deeply embedded with Oracle, and we are making incremental incremental process progress wherever we can to move away from that because we understand those implications. But I am deadly serious when I tell you that our ability to hire the resources to make those changes is extremely limited. And I absolutely welcome any of you that want to work on a design that accelerates that, because I understand both the cost and resource implications of where we are, but where we are is where we are. And we can't deny that. And I'm happy to go through the strategy in detail by product with you, because I don't, I don't like it any more than you do, <laughs> because I manage them every day. Just to get a quick clarification that might be important for people in the room, the it's not that you have to hire all those people in-house. I mean, of, of those checks that you're sending out to large companies, a lot of that is for support. Then those engineers are being paid more than 65000 a year at those companies, probably. So in other words, if a large company came to you willing to sell, an open source ERP mm -hmm. yep. and provide support for 10 years, mm -hmm. you could buy that. Mm -hmm. So it's not your ability to hire in, in the department specifically. And, then, and let's take into account the cost of implementation. Right. I mean, there's a there's a switch over cost and a one. Which is you know, extremely high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not hiring per se that's the issue necessarily. There is some hiring around support okay. and the ability to access those resources. It is skill level in particular, right? right? So we have, right. we have, uh, we went over Mongo. So we're enterprise Mongo customers. So we okay. we pay a quite a, real, a good price for the support that we do get, from them. and it's good support. Uh, but of course, you got to get those database administrators trained up, being able to support right. them. Right. So it's personal retraining yeah. and also hiring new people, possibly. Yeah. Right. Because you're going to want to have your front lines, and then when you can't figure it out, we we bounce it up. Because a lot of times we can figure out right. the front lines before we have to go open up a ticket. Sometimes it's legitimately right. the software. Most of the times so it's same configuration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. I don't know. This is probably on a, a different thread. Uh, so if there's still conversation going on here, I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting the way that you cast it into process requirements and functional requirements. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, it seems like so you said that the That's issue of not knowing the business problems is a knowledge transfer issue. It seems like um, that, so you said some people think, couldn't you just say what your business problem is and have not the 400 line item functional requirements? Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like that's pretty related. The knowledge yeah. transfer and the functional requirements being a little bit more open-ended. Mm -hmm. We've never tried to work with the city. We'd like to, uh, but whenever we work, for private companies, usually they have no idea what they need mm -hmm. or want. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's kind of the point is like, right. I don't know, like a lot of people here probably call it agile or the design process or lean startup, whatever. Right. And we're it's trying all to kind of more the of same that. kind of, you have to mm -hmm. do something and try it out. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out whether or not that's working and change course. And all those all those methodologies basically take that into account. Is that we don't know what you want in the first place. Right. So how could that be? How could that be worked in? It seems like, on one hand, it's a knowledge transfer issue, but also it's part of the procurement process. Like, how do you procure services when you don't actually know what you need in the first place? And I think that's exactly right. And that's something. Um, and in, in one of the other workshops, that absolutely came up. And that and and I don't know that we came up with a good answer. But there isn't a so we do have an RFI process, which helps a little bit where we can 
lay out a, a business challenge or, an, or a high-level need as we know it today. Like, what is the high standpoint? Uh, oh, sorry, request for information, okay. where we can say, um, well, or to take your bridge example, to get completely away from IT, right? We know we need a bridge that goes from this bank to this bank, and we don't want cars to fall through. That's all we know, right? Um, instead of ever? right, <laughs> no cars, no cars ever to fall through it. That's all we know, and and we don't we don't highlight that we want it to be steel, or we want it to be. We don't say any of those things, and we don't say we want it to be straight or curvy or anything. And we just put that out there and say, uh, give us your best ideas about how to do that. Um, and it doesn't result in a in a contract or anything. It just gives us the best ideas. And from that, we write a specification that goes into an RFP. So we have that process, which gets a tiny bit closer, but it's not um, what it doesn't give us is the ability to actually sit in a room and and whiteboard or question back and forth and actually converse where you where I can lay out, okay, I want to go from bank to bank and I don't want cars to fall in the river. And you can say, oh, did you ever think about what it would mean if you if you you know, build a span bridge, and that looks like this. And I can say, oh, well, but I'm worried about the wind, or something, whatever. Um, it doesn't give us that ability to go back and forth, and that's something we've been trying to think through a process of how to get more into that, how we get to that brainstorming kind of conversation, and do that in such a way that, that every vendor who's interested gets to have that same access. Yeah. That, that we're trying to figure out how to balance. So um, I find procurement, so from, from my perspective, um, our company stopped responding to our RFPs and RFIs about two years ago. Okay. And we've been a lot happier because of that. I can see. Um, <laughs> and it seems to me the mindset is always, let's buy something and look at the feature list and then compare four different offerings, mm -hmm. look at the price, drop a matrix, highlight the positives and then and interview yeah. them. And yep. sort of like a, it's an intricate dating game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in technology, Comparing two different stacks is sort of like comparing, you know, is French a better language than English? You know? Right. Mm -hmm. You lose the nuances. It's incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to do. And uh, at the end, it just boils down to price and sort of support and how deep is the bench, like what's the truck number of the company that, you know, mm -hmm. the bus number of the company when we're hiring them and so forth. And it seems to me for a city, it, it's very easy to get into the mindset of, oh, okay, you know, we have XYZ dollars, you know, budgeted, and here are here are these four fabulous vendors, and we want to just pay the person that can kind of provide the best mm -hmm. long-term support, right? That's sort of very, very long-term support, not innovation-driven. In no, I don't think we're long-term support focused. I mean, sustainability matters to us, certainly. But um, and this, that's why one of the things that we've been considering instead of the, the 400 long spec list, because I agree with you that kind of comparing you know, spec to spec gets you, I, I think you worded it really well, it's like a bad dating game of, you know, um, match.com can help us, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, Cupid is Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> really well, well, by local, I promise. Um, I, I do like this idea of trying to see if a, you know, as long as we are going to be somewhat within the structure of something RFP-like, where we have to put something out and you guys have to respond, of couldn't we get to a model where I put out a much more limited spec that actually captures my business problem, right? I'm going to beat this analogy to, a, to death of, I need to build a bridge. And instead of telling you how many bricks and how, my, how high and whatever, I just say, I need to build a bridge. And you guys come to me with the, all of the great ideas you have of how to build a bridge. And instead of comparing stats of companies, I'm comparing ideas of how you would do it. And I get to buy the best idea for, because I'm always going to have a budget constraint. I mean, every company does. That's not unique to the city. I'm going to have a budget constraint. I'm going to have I'm going to have other constraints. I'm going to have budget constraints and schedule constraints, etc. But at least then I'm comparing approaches and innovations and ideas. So I'm buying value within my constraints instead of, of stats. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If that, <laughs> wow, the left field of ideas. That's good, because I don't know how I feel about this idea. <laughs> Much of the work we do is on a large project, so we do a fair amount of design research and try to figure out who are the users, what do the users want to do, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and in this case, if we're just talking about like replacing the city's website, 
we have lots of examples of what city websites trying to do. We've got analytics. You can sit people in front of the website, ask them to do, do particular tasks, and you'll right. find out that very few of them can actually yeah, like do those tasks. Yeah. And and but it's it's a relatively simple project to spec. There's no reason for anyone to go through and figure out 400 things that need to be fulfilled, right. especially for the for the design part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the, the RFP process can be super light in that. In right. That type of well, and, and I don't know that we should focus on one approach being the right approach for every end game either. That's a fair point. Yeah, so building on that point, um, so one of the discussions so far has been about uh, how can the city better uh, allow for companies in, in, in Stroom and, and, and in other rooms uh, to be able to respond to needs that the city knows it has and thinks it knows how it wants them solved. Mm -hmm. right? But a lot of the folks in this room are about finding new ways of solving needs that the city might not know it has, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, once, once they discover it, it's sort of valuable. Um, and uh, some examples of, of, I think, fairly successful versions of solving for that problem are uh, like InQtel for, for the CIA. Right? The CIA, uh, a long time ago, decided, and I know this is a. Uh, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Um, so they decided, well, you know, we don't know what, what the next challenge is, but we'd like to be ahead of it no matter what. Um, so we will figure out some way to have some relationship with, with a, a VC that, uh, that is an ongoing, uh, in an ongoing basis, is investigating these that are solving for a particular set of problems. Right? Um, and I'm not sure there isn't uh, an opportunity in, in a very non-inkutel way to do a, 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 a similar thing with, with uh, the city of Chicago. Right? Um, uh, I, I want to just throw that out there as a very highly speculative idea. But well, maybe that's the answer to the question we were talking about before: is how do we get wrap something around capturing the the innovations that are coming out of Chicago that address city problems that we don't even know are a match yet, right? They'll always be like I believe we will find some answer to how we connect when I know I have a problem and there's an answer out in Chicago, right? That's how we fix the procurement process. But maybe that's the answer, or the start of the answer to how we wrap our, around, our arms around the innovations that are being developed in Chicago and the problems that are ever present to our city um, is some sort of CIA-like body. Um, we might want to find a different analogy to drive this idea. But yeah. Um, so, first, uh, I want to say uh, it's like 104 degrees in here, and so I need a little bit of an energy <laughs> boost. So, if everybody could go ahead and give a high five to somebody around them, I think that that's going to increase our energy level. Oh, go ahead and do that's that. That's not bothering me. It's just, it's just yeah, required. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just I, I'm considering where my coat is and whether or not I can use it for a pillow. Um, <clears throat> So uh, one thing is I want to agree with uh, Michael in what he was describing about uh, preparation, or what I call it, is, is it, uh, that before we start building something, we should prepare first. Yeah. And um, we we have a process for that. I, I know Paul has a process for that. But you you know all of these things should be leveraged for it, and it should cost money because when it costs money, we do it. and we're doing work mm -hmm. that is specific for us to deliver. Uh, a, that thing you can take and then use later, mm -hmm. that is incredibly valuable. And um, you know, we can always you know make it easier uh, from bottom line perspective uh, because it's a city. Um, but in all reality, that preparatory phase is is super awesome and, and important. Um, Canada has this uh, thing. I, I, I wanted to juxtapose from the uh, FBI example. Thank you, Matt. Uh, <coughs> uh, so McKinsey and Associates built this thing for Canada. Maybe it was just Toronto. I don't remember. Um, but basically, it was a system where you could say, here, I'm the government. This is this problem I'm having. Can we form a dialogue around this problem that I'm having and see if there are things out there that we can solve with it? And it's like a message board in combination with people saying, yeah, I think that's a complete RFP. Let's go ahead and try that. Um, and me and Matt have had a similar conversation in regards to another project he's working on where we might uh, venture out into building that system as well, which would be super sweet. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's all I got. They have, but Canada also has a there's a procurement process in Canada that existed to support that, 
and which I've actually been through. It's it's actually a really interesting process, and I like how it works. Um, and the vendors are nominally paid, and I agree with you on that, right? For for true design work, that's real work. It should be rewarded as such. Um, and and it really is an interesting process to go through, um, and you end up at a much better solution uh, at the end of the day. Um, and they whittle down the number of vendors as they go through. It's actually really, really interesting and an interesting way to work. You find it in a couple places in Europe, too. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so kind of bringing it all the way back to what Mike was saying, I think I'm actually surprised by all the hands that shut up. Nobody said this yet, but we talked about the idea of of uh, getting some information from people, putting an RFI out there to get the best ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've found in making lots of stuff is that most of our ideas are actually bad until you figure out that you try them and you realize, oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, this is, I learned yeah. from that. Yeah. And, and so the key word I want to put out there is experimentation, mm -hmm. right? That is what makes some of the best software out there. And I know there is a fundamental a challenge with, with the experimenting when you're talking about the government because yeah. things can't fail. However, some things you can test out in a way that is low, low risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't, like, I, I don't know how that works into the RFP process. If it's more about, you mentioned this pilot right. phase, like type of thing you could do. I mean, that seems like that's the where the innovation really is. Is actually trying to build something, seeing if it, like, having it fail, and then like figuring out what went wrong, and then build the next thing. Right? That's, that seems like at least that's how I like. That's how. I like. <laughs> yeah, experimentation is a tough one. But not, not everything is a huge system, right? There's a lot of sure. systems. Yeah, no, it's right. Small not everything, everything is our ERP system. Absolutely. Right? Yep. We're going to bring some water. Don't despair. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to have to stand back up. Yes. Um, so we were talking a lot about process. I want to switch into more of a functional role. Um, so I personally, my interaction with government paperwork, have been trying to get to funding and going out E-rate, which is like a nightmare, nightmare yeah. right? Because the forms are so awful, yeah. right? And the forms are scary and terrifying. It's like, a, it's like your tax return on steroids. Um, and even though like they have instructions, the instructions make no sense. Yeah. Um, I think that that is a huge component um, Especially like all of the city requirement specific paperwork to make sure that you're not like knowing that you're like having a third cousin that might know Mayor Daly. Like, <laughs> like um, anything in that respect would be huge. Yeah, some of that stuff's ordinance driven, so I don't have uh, much control over some of that. Um, so we did, so, so to talk to some of those requirements, we've gotten some input from other groups that, that have already led to changes. So some things that, that might matter to this group are things like um, some of the references used to require that you be like the prime vendor. And I know that, um, I don't know how many of you in this room, but some startups like start off with work as a sub to a bigger company. And your work as a sub should matter just as much as your work as a prime. So that's a change that we're looking at. Because I actually don't care if you were the sub or a prime. If you did the work and the reference will speak to how well you did the work, that's what I care about when I'm checking your reference. So that some of that stuff we're able to streamline. Um, you know, so E-rate's federal, so so what they require, nothing I can do. Um, and I don't run the TIF program. But um, <laughs> uh, but but your point's taken. So we are looking at all of the the sort of forms. We are taking a look at ways to either streamline them so we're still getting the information that's meaningful to us when we assess things, and and hopefully bring not bring the bar down because the the, the sort of the hurdle needs to be appropriate, but it also should be answerable, um, and instructions should be clear. I absolutely agree on that. And um, and actually, to James's point, I think that actually, and, and I know a couple of other people have commented on that. You'll actually find our procurement department is incredibly responsive. So if you're ever reading instructions to something that comes from that department and you don't understand them, just call them or email them. Like I can't promise you that it'll be easy to find the information, but not understanding what information they're asking for is something they can definitely help with. Like they, they will help you get over the hurdle. And, and typically every procurement is a contact person. Yeah. That, that would be the person that yeah. um, You know, one thing I'm just struck by the theme of a lot of these questions is that these these firms that uh, would like to do work with the city, I mean, we're really client service. Firms and a big component. We at the end of, at the end of 
the contract we deliver a product, mm -hmm. but um, that's uh, but the but the relationship and the uh, and the and the relationship and the statements of works that we write are are often vague because it's really a service that we're providing. Um, and that just, um, it seems like any, any, this is actually a kind of relationship that the city familiar with this is called a consultant, right? Yeah. You know, um, and you have a qualified consultant pool, mm -hmm. uh, and it seems, I mean, so, I mean, like, one thing that I'd like to do more research on personally is just, like, how hard is it to get into that pool? Mm -hmm. uh, is there maybe, maybe a way, maybe one way to, one thing to consider is, is that maybe there should be another tier of pools. Because I, I, I really, I mean, I just, I mean, just my own thing, and hearing the kind of questions that come up, up over and over again is, is that, like, most, many of the people who are, who, who are in this room believe that in order to build good technology for our client, we have to really understand the client, and that, that has to happen through a rich, iterative, um, you know, trusting relationship. Uh, and that's not what we're, and like that is quite different, right? That's a quite different kind of offering than, than even something that we've been talking about in simplifying the RFP process. Yeah, no, and I think, um, well, one, I absolutely agree with you that in the consultative and, and sort of services relationship, the better we know each other um, and the better you understand my problems and needs, the better the output's going to be. And it, and one thing for us to go back and look at, I think, is the MCA pool and how we might be able to leverage that idea. That's the master consulting agreement that has in it pools for strategic consulting, pools for design work, pools for web development. So I think we have a structure there that might be helpful if we can figure out how to make that available. Thank you so much. To, to smaller companies because I feel like for some of the more medium-sized companies that are in those pools now, um, that for some of them, we have a very good relationship in some cases. So clearly, we figured this model out in a couple of small examples. So we can do it. So yeah. we just need to figure out how to do it, uh, lever down a little bit, I think, for smaller companies that, that have more like, you know, maybe 10 employees-ish as right. opposed to 50 employees. So I think we have a model we can work with, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, I guess this is uh, following up on comments about agile development processes being critical, and yes. yet um, in an RFP there isn't necessarily space to talk about that kind of process. But we kept talking about the bridges, and, and we talked about the CIA. And, um, but I wanted to bring up a local example of what I really agile I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, of a really great design process, which is, which is actually looking at parks in the 603 Mendale Trail. And the city conducted a series of design workshops working with a number of community-based institutions that were targeted as key users mm -hmm. before the final plans were ever rendered. And I mean, I think that that's a nice parallel to agile processes because I think this point about city officials maybe the, the radar of city officials when they're thinking about what needs to be accomplished might be really different than looking from the community organization perspective or the school perspective or the park perspective. And um, this one more comment about parks recently, we had a talk by uh, the IT person from the Chicago Park District and Steve, or Tony? Steve, I think. Is that right? Was anyone here for this park Okay. Um, and there was a comment from the audience that was like, well, you know, this is all interesting, but how do I sign up for the NAFTA class? <laughs> Something like that. So, so I, I just wanted to, to put forward the example of the 606 is, it, is it maybe a parallel to Agile and, and so thinking about that kind so of... So that's actually the approach we're taking with the 311 system is there will be public, I don't know if I would call them necessarily design sessions, mm -hmm. but public input sessions. Mm -hmm. And we're still working through what the approach will be there and they won't happen probably until late summer, early fall in the schedule for that. Um, and, and we're doing that for two reasons. One, I don't dare deploy the city's largest public-facing system without <coughs> public input. Mm -hmm. Not only would the public probably kill me, but so would the mayor, right? He set, I think, a, a standard that public input matters to him, and so it matters to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it mattered to me before him, but you know, he, <laughs> he, he uh, makes sure that it matters to all of us. Um, but also, 
I, I don't think I can deploy a public facing system that will work without their input. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we're going to do that through the Chicago Collaborative because I think that's, for me in the city, that's our best arm for coordinating that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that's a great model. We actually just, we haven't had, at least in my tenure with this department, um, which, which frankly is like the last two years, we actually haven't had a, a project that has required that yet. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had the chance to, well, actually the budget system sort of, uh, which was only that first year of the, of the budget, not the budget system, but the budget site that collected budget ideas. Um, was a bit of that interaction, um, but in the fall of 2011, that was sort of that idea. So, but, but more suggestions like that would be great. That's something that we actually want to do more of. Um, so I, I've never been on anything, and I don't think I ever will. <laughs> I don't have a business that does that. Okay. But I'm a, I'm always looking for information about projects, and sometimes you start with the bid proposal. Or sorry, the RFP. Okay. And it's really hard to stay updated on what the new ones that are coming out are. Yes, we hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe it works like there's a PDF for all the proposals that were issued that week. And you have to find the IT ones in between the sand. And right. The and the yes. file name of the PDF changes to reflect the week, which is probably a good file naming uh, scheme. But then it means like. Okay. I can't really rely on finding it in the same place every time, or sorry, the, the, the latest proposals. Right. And then it's like highlighted in alternating yellow and white, which is really hard to keep track of like yeah. when you're reading rows. I'm um, only giggling because it's not a day goes by that um, this is what I've ever had a dime for every time someone tells us that, that we shouldn't do And we're working on uh, better ways to do this. So, so one thing to let you guys know is that we are um, outside of this IT procurement um, initiative of trying to make this better, the procurement department itself is going through a huge modernization, um, both from a system and process perspective, around all of its processes and all of its IT, which will do a couple of things. So one, we're looking for something immediately to make it easier to search all of the uh, all of the RFPs, both. So anyone, whether they plan to bid or not, can find RFPs easier, and you can sort of sort and find all the IT ones easier if that's what you care about, or all the construction ones easier. Um, so hopefully there'll be an immediate answer to that, uh, or a near immediate answer to that uh, soon. But in the slightly longer term, because um, it is a it is a pretty massive undertaking to modernize that. Because it's actually not just that department, right? Every city department is a procurement user, right? So that is a citywide project to implement a new system and all the new processes um, for that. Um, so I think the time horizon is 18 months or something on that. So because it's 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 BPR first and then the system implementation, but that will do things that we can't do now, like. When you bid the city, like if you bid before, the city will already have your information and you'll just be iterated, things like that that we can't do today. Um, and, and I just mentioned that so that you'll understand that there are some things going on if you are a common user of the system that is going to make bidding with the city much, much, much easier from a document management perspective and all of those things. Um, that's still a very paper heavy process today. There's, there's also, you can sign up for DPS alerts. Right. And we'll email you the hard read PDF so you don't have to search for it on the, the website. Yeah, right, but the thing is, I'm not interested in getting them. I just want to find them. No, I have list. Well, I'll just send you the list. We'll, we'll email you the Right, but I don't want the list every time it comes out. I just want to be able to find what's in the list when I need to find it. So I do, I'm a reporter, so I wanted to find out all the bidders for the Divi bike share. And I wanted to read the RFP, and that was very difficult to find. Then to yeah. become, to become like, I want to see the takeout list. Right. I don't want to be a takeout member myself, I just want to see the list. So what I'm telling you is that for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I understood, and I was responding to his right. comment. So for now. That's the best we can do. We're working on it along with like a hundred other things that we're working on. That's one thing that can make it a little bit easier. But and we're working on that because it's a common complaint, and we're hoping to have something that makes that better by this summer. So. And, and one of the secrets to, to searching for like takeout list and, and and things like that is to use the specification number. Yeah. On there, if you have that. that right. So I use like Google's advanced search techniques to do site. Mm -hmm. <laughs> colon, citychicago.org, file type, colon, PDF, 
then procurement number, and then I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in Finland, the Finnish government just put all of their RFPs on their open data portal. Yep. Within two weeks, people like people in this room created created yeah. searchable database and they crowdsourced, they tagged them. Mm -hmm. One of the big problems is there's no easy way. I mean, I'm on the EP alert, and I've totally given up. Been on there for three years now. And it's it's yep. impossible. <laughs> are, are they on? Are, Tom, are they on the portal now? That's actually uh, it's in the list of for this. I'm not sure where it is in the list. Though. It's on the list for uh, this year, though. Yeah, we're working on a, a way to better display information so you can even get better heads up as things come down the pipe. I mean, just put each each RFP on the portal, and we can take them, put them in a database, search the. You know, <coughs> Yeah. Did they did they actually attach the RFP to those? What? Did they attach the RFP to those? Yeah. And then you just put them in a you know, as a binary, and you search. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's an area we're going to have to figure out because we're going to have to do something in that area sometime in the next two years, right? So we're kind of trying to get ahead of the game. Um, and so we were interested in what other, and every, every other CIO or the person who ran impound said, yeah, there's like, there's nothing on the market to buy, there's nothing, right? So everybody has to come up with something, and that's a really good candidate. Well, we all have to do something. Do it once, let's do it together, pull our money, same idea. So we would definitely be up for it. I mean, almost you could develop like a plug-in architecture too, where yep. like, you know, if the city doesn't have the impound, they don't right. have that module. And that's exactly the idea behind this on the analytics side, right? The smart data platform that we're building, uh, which is around predictive analytics and spatial big data is the reason that's open source, the reason we're designing it that we are is Chicago is meant to be the, the home of that and other cities are meant to take from us and there's this idea that someone, and I don't know if it will be a university or a nonprofit, will step forward and be the library for that and other cities will donate volumes essentially to, um, but you know on the development side why there can't be like the, on the app development side, why there can't be the, a similar model? Absolutely, and we would definitely want to partner on that. Great idea. Yeah. So um, kind of going back to his friends there. Yeah. Uh, his point of experimentation and what you said about sort of lacking resources to experiment. Um, one of the places I've seen some of the most brilliant solutions to problems that we don't know exist yet is mm -hmm. hackathons. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, give developers and a big goal, beer, <laughs> and Pizza maybe some donuts. incentive, and see the blueprints yep. of the next skyscraper built up. Yep. Um, I missed the hackathon, but like, we're not trying to solve a problem that we don't know exists yet. Yep. You know? And I would personally be interested in doing one. Sure. We're, um, and there's always, you know, places willing to host. We're always willing to bring, if it's a city problem, bring resources to the table that can describe, like, you know, there's a need for some policy input or whatever, um, or a particular department. Um, and then I think the key with the hackathon is always making sure that there's there's a way to do follow through. Um, and there's some interesting things actually going on. Um, it's probably in the US too, I'm aware of what's going on in Europe around going from a hackathon to a shared platform to hack at home after so that like, it can go on for a couple of months because, you know, usually a hackathon for one day doesn't actually get right. you to so end maybe, job. So maybe you don't have the resources to find out about the problem that you really need to solve, mm -hmm. but maybe a hackathon reveals that problem. Yep. <coughs> sure. Oh, definitely. A uh, question from Twitter. <laughs> Last time it was the internet, now it's Twitter, they're after me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greater Good Studio says, Hello, Brennan Berman, exclamation mark. Can you make it easier to match up local government agencies with, and small businesses like us? Uh, for example, we're in a great we're in a grant with the Chicago Department of Public Health. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like they've already been matched, but yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah, no. And actually, I had this conversation with a, a niche company that is in the like the smart energy space, um, like energy efficiency space. So, um, like I'm a most of the general IT department, there are really, really specific technology initiatives going on in given departments. So I definitely can be the, the front door for people that want to find where in the city they should connect and who they should talk to. So I'm more than happy to be that person, which like goes to that one bullet up here about access to leadership. I may or may not be the person you should be talking to, and I'm happy to help you find that person. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, why not do something like uh, Innovation Fellows, like source people mm -hmm. before you need them? Mm -hmm. They do. We do. We, have, we, we do. We have we have fellows, um, but that's that's a specific program for like for grad students or college students, both, whatever. Um, but um, what what do you mean by innovation fellow? Well, I mean like so uh, working in education, and, and I'm a former teacher, so I'm very uh, about efficacy. So um, in working with like customers, we have like research partners essentially. Mm -hmm. So. As we dig into what's working and what's not, we get to you know, interact with them um, multiple times. And uh, so what we're coming to is a product that functionally works um, in their workflow because they were a part of the process. Okay. I feel like there's probably ways to do that in energy and in design and in a lot of uh, you know a lot of the, the kind of overarching areas that the city wants to improve in. Mm -hmm. But I think you know kind of categorizing and sourcing people early would be a really interesting way to engage. Like here's the problem, let's throw it at the, the design fellows or the yeah. So we have we have a couple of fellowship programs in the city that work in different ways. I'd love to learn more about how you worked and see if 
either it's overlap with what we have or if that's a new idea that we can leverage somehow. We also, I mean, and given, I mean, we're sitting in, in an incubator now. There's others in the city for different things. Um, I think it's probably very, very possible that there's partnerships that could fill some of these gaps that we haven't figured out yet. So I'd love to know more about that and figure out if there's a fit. Absolutely. That's a great idea. So just continuing on that, projecting forward to a year when they expanded out in 1821, and one of the four verticals they talked about is government. Um, and, and let's say that there is a a VC firm that is specifically uh, targeted at, at funding uh, uh, government contracts or you know, government related software. Is, I, I, this is, I guess, a legal question. Is it possible for uh, for a city official to sit on the board of that VC fund to at least review uh, applications to be able to say, oh, yes, this is going to really use this? We couldn't. I'm hoping you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm going to answer for James. I don't think we know yet, but I think that there, there would there would have to be some way for us to provide some to that. I think we figure it out, right? Somehow. Yeah, the trick is <laughs> the trick is voting council. Yeah, yeah. There's a big one in uh, Louisiana where Teach for America person was on the uh, board of it as well. Right. Yeah. They they and they ran into they ran into trouble big trouble in Louisiana with that. So. Sense, but the the value of that. Act let me get this much of a wrong. Sorry, now I'm gonna go. Uh, the value of that ads is that it lets you try stuff uh, and incubate stuff without taking on risk, without needing right. to go through the whole procurement process, right? Exactly. Right. But the other the other but we've also found we found other mechanisms to bring like like pro this is slightly different, but we found other mechanisms to bring like pro bono companies to the table in, in the city without uh, like jeopardizing their ability to bid on work in the city at other times, which is some stuff. So we found, and, and, and these were perfectly appropriate mechanisms, so we found ways to make it work so that companies are getting input from the city so that they know they're on the right track, so they're getting the business input they need from the city, and and we're not crossing any of the, the ethical boundaries or whatever that the city is bound by because we're managing public dollars, et cetera. So um, I mean, I'm, I'm watching the development of that that vertical very, very, very closely for obvious reasons. So I'm sure we will find a way for it to work. There's also lots of people in the city that have left city government and moved into the nonprofit space. Or we have the Chicago Collaborative, which is the nonprofit extension of sort of government tech efficiency. Like that's the design of it. So purposely. So there's people out there, Matt, who know a lot about what we do <laughs> on purpose, <laughs> um, who can provide input as well. So I'm sure we would figure some way for that to work. It's too valuable for us not to figure it out. As we would have to avoid what happened in Louisiana. None of us look good in orange. Um, so touching back on the idea of the innovation fellows, so it's interesting yeah. like thinking about it from that framework. And then going back to sort of earlier in the conversation where you were citing some resource constraints for it, I, I can only pay people $65,000 and like that's not attractive enough to go work right. for government or whatever the number is, yeah, somewhere in that ballpark, right? right? Uh, but all of a sudden when you say you're an innovation fellow, like that sounds cool, right? Mm -hmm. like actually plenty of people go work for the federal government under, under their presidential innovation fellows program. I don't think they get paid very much. Right, yeah. yeah, they get paid very little. But it's the culture of being a fellow, of uh, being a fellow, right. having sort of this vehicle, having a class of people that you it's can kind of be. Right, yeah. There are plenty of people and like Look at and this room of people who do stuff for free already. And like, there are it would do that. Well, no, and let's be clear, there are parts of my department, right? Yeah. The when when we have openings for data engineer, I get more applications than I know what to do with. And and to be clear, right, that position pays a bit more than sixty five thousand, but it doesn't come anywhere near what data engineers in the private sector make. But it is, I would argue that we have the leading municipal data um, data analytics program in the country. Mm -hmm. And you guys all live in Chicago, so you should all be nodding. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, can't wait to see it. We'll <laughs> <laughs> talk to you about it whenever you want. Um, and we are happy to have any of you. Uh, there are lots of ways that we can have you come and volunteer your time to be part of it, actually, um, without too many hurdles. But we, we get more more high powered, like high quality resumes and we know what to do with like one position that we have to hire. Um, it's fantastic. And then when I need to hire a web developer, 
Um, and I actually, I mean, we actually will be posting for one of, or actually two or three of those short So as long as I'm here, I might as well do the pitch. And I want to say the salary for that is. I don't know. I know. Like you with, yeah, like, let's call it 75. Not a ton. I know that. But you can still feed your cat, right? It's not peanuts. <laughs> um, if you've got three kids and a wife, probably not so much. Three kids and a husband, depending on, you know, what your family style is like. Um, but we do some pretty amazing, you know, internal development. And I'm in the process of trying to build inside development capacity in the city of Chicago so that, one, we're not as married to packages as we are today. Right? I don't want to be there, but there are real reasons I'm there. And we're doing mobile development for one of the largest infield workforces in the country. Right? We are serious about mobile development. Um, and not only that, but you know, and you guys, you guys run startups, right? You are intrigued by building teams and building foundations, right? You don't want to go work. You, I'm assuming because you're sitting here. Many of you don't want to go work for a big company and have someone who's already done the design hand it to you and say, go build this, right? You've either already done that or you don't ever want to do that. Um, and so I'm building a team, right? So there is room for you to come in and build the foundations, decide what you're going to do, build the culture. It's a blank slate right now, right? That's why there's so many openings. And this is something the city hasn't done before, right? We have traditionally done all of our web development through contractors. Hence, why some of it looks the way it does. <laughs> so, when you see those openings and I come back in, it's probably going to be a month and say, you know, these are the links to go and apply for those jobs, I would hope that some of you would either consider it if it's something that fits with your plans, et cetera, or will say to your friends, look, this isn't, you know, some cheesy $75,000 job. I have, I have. The mayor supports, <laughs> right, 30 lines of business. That's actually a really complex business. There's very few companies that have 30 different lines of business, right? It's healthcare one day, it's infrastructure the next, it's economic development the next, and we do development for all of those lines of business. It's pretty extraordinary. It's a chance to actually build a startup from the ground up in that complexity. That's what we're doing with our web team. And then you can come back here and actually talk to all these startups and figure out how to get them for money, because we will figure that part out, that's what tonight's about, to come and help, right? Because I'll never have a, an internal team that can do all the work. Do you want a job? Since we're talking about procurement <laughs> reform, why don't we do hiring reform, because that's even easier. Um, <laughs> yeah, have, and luckily that's not my job, the hiring reform. Do you, so for those who don't know, there's an even more insidious problem in Chicago. <laughs> I'm going to get totally on my soapbox. It's called the Shackman Degree. Oh, it was God. A well -intentioned, I'm with you on that. It was a well-intentioned yeah. measure. Do you want to stand on your soapbox? Uh, I'm just on my laptop. So it was a it was a well-intentioned uh, reform passed by progressives in the 60s that made it much harder for the Chicago machine to operate. The machine used to trade votes for jobs. That's why like a third of the city was some guy's, you know, some automan's neighbor, and it made our government pretty crap. Uh, so what they did is basically lock down jobs. So you had to specify oh. what the job description is. You have to go through a huge, really involved review process. And fast forward, you know, 50 years, and now it means that it can take up to 18 months to hire people, right? So, so forget the, the the pay differential, right? Who's going to wait for 18 months to get a job? I don't, I don't know. I can't do that. Um, and you have to apply through Explorer. That's not my fault. Oh um, wow! So <laughs> try telling that to a developer that you're trying to hire. Wow. I think that the core point here is we need to find ways that you can work with with people who are really good at the technology. I don't, I don't care if it's if they sit on the outside. I actually think it's cooler if they sit on the inside. The question is, how much flexibility do you have in making those hires? So one of those positions is not covered by that that Shackman decree that he's talking about, which, by the way, the amount that you know about what goes inside of, on the side of the city is impressive. Very good. I don't know how many Very good. Um, so one of those, which is the director of title keeps changing, you can make it up if you want. One of those will be like the director of like software architecture and development or whatever, the person in charge of defining and leading this army of three software developers. <laughs> um, that one is not covered by the Shackman uh, decree. So I can hire whoever I want. If a little green Martian shows up and he's got the skills, he's in. Um, the other ones are covered by that decree, which means, and it's not quite 18 months because a lot of that is time that I have to go through before it ever, before that job posting ever hits the public. It can take me anywhere from 
three to six months to hire someone. But from the time that you submit your resume through Internet Explorer, please don't shoot me. Um, that's not me. Swear to God. Um, and I and and the team reviews those resumes. They get and they get reviewed by people before we ever see them. And the, and you could get interviewed. It can take three to six months from when you apply to the city, and we can actually call you and say you're the one we want. Please come work for us, which is a really long time. So just warning you up front. But but again, yeah. So that's. Small detour onto hiring, but I figured I was here to make the pitch. You keep raising your hand. Oh, um, yeah. I was I was wondering about that. Um, I don't know if you I don't know if you guys are able to do this, but I know about but I've heard of like some companies that have like either some sort of like system or some sort of software program in which like a, in which when a person submits their resume into a database, it reads certain keywords off of their resume and then it submits it like to the hire to the hiring people yep. that they're looking at jobs for. Would you guys be able to do that or would you guys have constraints to do that necessarily or we use a system called Taleo. Yeah. Which wasn't owned by Oracle when we bought it, but is now. I can't get away from it no matter what I do. <laughs> um, and uh, and actually it's used by most of the city agencies. Um, like schools, etc. Um, it does some keyword searching, yeah. um, but then there's a, a, a human pass as well done by our HR department before stuff gets to us. So um, a while ago we were talking about uh, developing pools of people to look for uh, in terms of different uh, domains uh, of expertise. Uh, and now some other people talked about different ways of uh, kind of formalizing uh, the structures that you want to have set up for these kinds of pools of talent, um, the, the fellowship, um, yep. the VC, the, the, someone on the board, representing mm -hmm. uh, the city of Chicago. Um, I think these are all really great directions to go. I had a, I had my own kind of idea that I something I might have heard of once, but uh, sort of a well, let me circle around to it. Um, uh, the city uh, has these needs that, that they have uh, that they don't necessarily know how to, how to solve, uh, but the community of developers has lots of knowledge that they actually seem to want to share with you guys. Um, so maybe if you were able to give uh, two community developers a way to um, select uh, people to, to not to work on the projects themselves for procurement, uh, but to offer domain expertise. Uh, oh. Like an advisory? Yeah, get an advisory. Or an advisory panel. I, I was thinking really of a non-profit corporation that the city, yeah. uh, the city had. Uh, but uh, yeah. something like that, and like people could be um, you know, precluded from, from accepting the, the contract themselves, the other company could be uh, if, right. if they wanted to be on that board, it could be like rotating. Mm -hmm. um, but just something like that that would allow the community to uh, be, be directly part of the, that formalization structure. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. <laughs> I wrote down most of yeah. these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> the reason, the reason I, I wrote that. down all the ideas but yours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, I thought of um, like how how is how is Linux uh, developed right now? That operating system Linux, mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is that it's not developed by a bunch of geeks and hackers anymore. Uh, at least not directly. It's it's developed by big companies. Uh, it's developed by Google and and IBM and whoever else. Uh, and the reason that they're doing it is because um, the community basically realized that they can open source uh, this these, these responsibilities. Uh, by kind of making it a, a social stigma, if you're not, if you're a big company, you're not contributing to you know, step to the uh, development of this uh, of this thing that we're doing, trying to develop. So coming back to it, you know, it's just like if someone wants to elect themselves to be, be a member on a board for a while and to like help inform your decisions. Yeah, no, that would be a really cool way to do that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Who you get to do, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> you have to see his resume. <laughs> yeah, get back to it. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It seems like it does have applications. Yeah. They used to be really good for hiring thing. Mm -hmm. Is the hiring thing again? Because then you have to then this board is, is advisory board is helping you figure out who to hire. Yeah, an advisory board on hiring might give our HR department some pause, but, uh, <laughs> but on other topics, definitely a good idea. Yeah, I think it, it's just good to get to know, you know, what, what your bench is. Like, any good coach definitely needs to know, yeah. you know, what happens uh, down the line. Like, yeah. you have the first five minutes of the game, it's great, and that's really kind of like who you're selecting ultimately for the, you know, RPs. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's really just, I think, important to get to that level where you do know. It would be great if you, like, because of an advisory board or because of fellows, you knew exactly who you were going to hire for some of these jobs as, you know, sort of circumstance kind of aligns. Yep. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's great. What about um, public grants that are managed by your group to meet certain innovation goals, like uh, maybe a grant to quadruple broadband speeds? Anybody that came up with ideas for that? Yeah, no, so grants are, IT grants are tough. They, um, though I'd, I'd love to have more. So my department has, well, since uh, ERA ended, right, we had a big BTOP grant, which was all about public computing. Um, which was huge out in like the communities, etc. Um, but that ended at the end of 2013. We have one grant from the Bloomberg from Bloomberg Philanthropies for the development of the smart data platform. Um, that is being completely utilized by by Carnegie Mellon and one higher into our department. Um, that was actually very specific for that. Um, most grants that I've ever seen, and I'm not opposed to actually continuing to look, and if you guys ever see grants that require like the city to apply, but then we could utilize them with you, you should definitely let me know, because we'll do the work around that. Um, most grants are like in the mission space, like it's a healthcare grant that has a technology component, or it's an education grant with a technology component or whatever. Um, I rarely find grants that are actually for the, for the technology itself. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of conversations with the big foundations like MacArthur or the or Chicago Community Trust, et cetera, about trying to change that. And there's some of the more in, innovative foundations um, for that. But there's just there's not a lot of grant dollars out there that are actually f directed at the technology, per se. They're more at the mission space, and then you get to spend it on the technology to deliver on that. Um, but if you guys ever see anything and you need the city to be a partner on it, let me know. Like We'll, we'll do the work with you. Um, Especially for like the experimental stuff, because it's really hard to spend the tax dollars on something experimental, right? That's where the can't fail thing comes from. Um, but grant dollars, totally different ballgame. <laughs> so you're encouraged, right? No, but it is. It's, I mean, it's not that you don't have to be be careful with the money, right? You still want to be a steward of the money, but it's it's not tax. It's you know, it's not taxpayer dollars, so we can be a little more adventurous with it. So. Yeah, um, well, we're all thinking right now about the special problems that a government like the city of Chicago or others, the federal government, mm -hmm. faces. But um, in my life, and I'm, I'm sure uh, other people have had this experience, there is a similar kind of pervasive culture of procurement in corporations and in large nonprofits, and even in small nonprofits, yep. where the, the idea is, well, how could we possibly do this task? We, you know, we have to RFP, and um, which tends to um, uh, limit the playing field to the heavy weights and the cumbersome operations, um, and exclude small nimble shops. Um, so what I'm wondering is, it, as a CIO, you must be aware of the um, thought leaders in the world of procurement, and how can we turn this ship around? I, um, you know, we've actually, so I, what, I, I sort of wasn't inherently aware of them, and so as part of this initiative, we, we rounded up some of the, like, analysts in the, in the policy department in the mayor's office and actually sort of started asking that question, so what did others, you know, because other cities have this problem, and we're still sort of looking. And certainly other people at the same time as us are trying to figure this out. We've agreed, well, we'll share our ideas if you share your ideas. And um, we haven't found anybody that seems to be a, a leader in this yet. Um, and and if, if you guys stumble across anyone, you know, down to like basically kind of Googling this, we're like, does anybody come? 
So nobody seems to have cracked the code yet, but we're planning to. The Meteor Foundation is getting interested in this Who issue. Who is? I'm sorry. A Meteor Foundation. Oh, okay. They're the really weird one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. They <laughs> they Maybe like, they have some money to help us. Yeah. So they, they they gave a grant to the to Code for America to start doing policy research on this. Okay. Uh, and they're generally looking to invest in that issue. Okay. So, good. Yeah. Definitely look at that. Yeah. No, that sounds like a good phone call. They're also talking. To Okay. Um, but yeah, no, but it's one, if you guys come across anything, whether it's a, a white paper or a good website, something that you think we should know about, by all means, I mean, I'm easy to find. It's, you know, it's ACIO, easy to email, but feel free to certainly do that. And then as we're pulling all these ideas together, we're going to, we'll email them back out and I'll get them to, um, to Juan, get them back out to people. But we haven't found anybody, like, it's not like, you know, we found a city like Barcelona did an awesome job at this and we'd like to model what we did after them. We haven't found that person yet. Have you seen the the documentation that Martha Lane Fox wrote for the UK? Yeah, and it's like bigger than just procurement, but like yeah, there's some they wrote a bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's some ideas in there that I think we can leverage. Yeah. So we've been through that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's more bits and pieces. Yeah, absolutely. But good ideas. So there are parts of interacting with the the city and other departmental and uh, other uh, and other sister agencies. Uh, uh, websites that are so painful that you can you can make a product that is provided a better experience and like as a business. Um, I think actually the one about parts comes up a lot. People really hate trying to figure out like, what's to going on. Rich for like, kids for, like yeah. Even you think there'd be something where you know like if we had a Kickstarter and we had like look like. We got ten thousand people to. I mean, we got ten. We raised. We got. We got. We got a budget of ten ten thousand yeah, dollars, right? But like, do you think there might be a mechanism to like where we got a matching grant program from from uh, the city for like yeah, there's like we either demonstrated demand to like fix this particular pain point for the citizens of Chicago. That's an interesting idea. I mean, we'd always have to. We'd have to, you know. For money, I always have to, you know, make sure the budget office and the mayor's office are aligned if it's not already something in our budget. So that's a really interesting idea. Kind of crowdsource the other half of the money. I mean, I mean, you're doing two things. You're like, you're demonstrating that like people, people you know, care, care, right? That there's and then, like, you know, yeah. and you're, I mean, that's and you're, I mean, which is probably the awesome. more valuable signal, you know? Yeah. Uh, but well, yeah, I mean, if but you also are deferring. You're deferring mm -hmm. some costs. Mm -hmm. Well, we do these crowdsourcing to help fund some of the many of these program expansions, so it's not yeah totally yeah totally yeah totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Sorry. yeah totally can we find a city one I mean I'm happy to connect you guys to sister agencies but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some of the examples over there. Yeah. <laughs> really? There's something about our website you don't like? So there's something about your website that people have offered us. Have asked us to, Absolutely. To have offered to pay us a fix for them. Yep. No, I think it's a great idea. <coughs> I like that. Are we are we all spent out?